In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was in the beginning with God, and the Word was God. And when God made all the things in the beginning, there was nothing that was made without the Word. And the Word was life, and this life was the light of men. And no matter what darkness would try to do, the light would, would, would overwhelm it. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And He was full of grace and truth. And He was born of water and blood to a virgin. As the prophet Isaiah taught 700 years before, he said, Therefore the Lord shall conceive Himself and give you a sign. And behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and He shall call His name Emmanuel. And the prophet Micah foretold centuries before the Word was born in a city called Bethlehem, an ancient city where a thousand years before the judge Samuel was directed by the God I Am to find a man after God's own heart to anoint his king. And, this, and God uh, rejected men who were greater in the sight of the world. And the Lord God I Am chose a skinny-armed, red-faced, somewhat feminine-appearing shepherd boy to be a shepherd over his people. The people he had set aside to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. 28 generations later, his grandson was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born to Mary. And he was conceived righteous. And he would be brought to trial by unrighteous men and die for the sin of all the people of the earth. And he was brought again into the world to be rejected by the world as Isaiah taught. He was despised and rejected by man, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And this, and this tiny infant, the eternity of God, bound up within frail human flesh, knew this rejection from the very first breath that he took, because the very first breath that he took, he smelled the excrement of animals, because he was born in a cattle stall, and he was laid to rest in a hay manger. The bread of life made his first bed in a place where animals ate. God instructed Mary and Joseph, to name his son, his only begotten son, whom he loves, Jesus. And when, he, and, and when he was born, angels filled the nighttime sky to tell of his coming, to talk about the peace that he was bringing between, between uh, 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 human beings and God. And shepherds glorified, and they, and they praised God, the one of whom Zechariah prophesied, he, who, who he called the shepherd of the Lord's flock. And astrologers and soothsayers from far in the east came to lay gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh at his feet, traveling months, maybe even years, to get to him. And Jesus, the word of God, grew. We know that the family fled to uh, Egypt in order to escape the murderous wrath of um, Herod the Great, uh, the so-called king of the Jews, because he thought that, they, that this infant king would uh, take his throne away. We know that when Herod died, the family returned from Egypt to live in Mary and Joseph's hometown of Nazareth. What would it have been like? What would it have been like to uh, grow up as God's only son, the wealth of eternity bound up in a frail human flesh? How did he, how did he wrestle with his destiny? Um, did he struggle knowing that he created every person and, and everything that he could see with his dull cow eyes? How did he endure seeing his law broken at every turn and people taking his name in vain? Suppose he ever uh, peered into the heavens and wished he could see the face of his father? Do you think he ever had any doubts that one man could possibly pay for the sin of everyone who would ever live or who would ever live? When Jesus was 12 years old, his family went to the temple in Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover. The Lamb of God, he would soon be called. The Lamb of God witnessed the sacrifice that he himself would someday make to take away the sins, not just of the Jewish people, but of the whole world, once and for all. And his family unknowingly left Jerusalem and traveled back to Nazareth. And they returned three days later, um, only to find Jesus sitting in the temple, holding court among Judah's finest teachers. This 12-year-old boy was listening and he was asking questions and taxing the rabbis lifelong learning and understanding. And all who, who heard him, including Mary and Joseph, were astonished by this. And by the way, this would not be the last time that Jesus astonished people. And Mary being astonished, of course, did not stop her from doing what mothers always do. 
she chastised her son, who also happened to be her God. And she was angry. She was angry. If Jesus had had a middle name, she would have used it. <laughs> Someone after first service said, I thought, I thought he did have a middle name. I'm like, what's that? The Jesus the Christ. I said, I don't, I don't think so. But uh, she said to Jesus, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I, your father and I, have been searching for you with great distress. And Jesus, the boy, already aware of his special place in the cosmos, replied in astonishing fashion, turning the question around on his questioner, as he would do countless times to come. Did you not know? Did you not know that I would be in my father's house? Jesus grew up, and he increased in uh, wisdom and favor and stature with God and humanity. The word teaches us. Jesus' cousin was John the Baptist. And John was a wild man. He was a wild man. He wore animal skins. He preached to huge crowds out in the wilderness. He ate insects that he dipped in wild honey. John's God-given role. John, the, the job that God gave to John, foretold by the prophet Isaiah, was to point to his cousin, to prepare the way, to direct the eyes of the entire world to the blessing of Jesus. Now, John had known Jesus since before he was born, at about as, uh, as a fetus, as a fetus, six months from conception. He leapt in his mother Elizabeth's womb at the very sound of Mary's voice. And as a man, he preached in the wilderness of Judea alongside the river Jordan. To everyone who'd been given ears to hear, here's what John said. He said, repent, repent. There is a fiery judgment coming. Get to those who have none. Do not extort the poor. Do not take more than is allotted to you. Be content with what you have. And all the people wondered, is, he, is, is John the one? Is he the one? Is he the one the prophets have spoken about for thousands of years who will set us free, who will restore the kingdom? Is he the Messiah? Is he the Christ? John said, I'm not. But the Messiah is close. He's close. He said, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. One day as John was baptizing people to wash away their sins, his cousin, who had no sins to wash away and who would someday wash away the sin of the world with his blood came to him to be baptized. And John protested. He said, it is you who should be baptizing me. But Jesus said, let it be so for now. And when Jesus came up from those sparkling waters, the heavens were open and the Holy Spirit descended upon him like a dove and a voice echoed down from heaven for all to hear an astonishing truth. It said, you are my beloved son. With you, I am well pleased. Now, you may ask, what do you do after the heavens open and the Spirit of God alights upon you like a dove and fills you and a voice speaks from the clouds and says, you're my son. With you, I am pleased. What do we do? Well, Jesus said later, the Son of Man came to serve, not to be served. And immediately the word says that he was, he was driven further into the wilderness to fast and pray and be tempted for 40 days by an old enemy. The day star, the son of dawn, the one who said in his heart, I will ascend to heaven above the stars and I will make myself God. But was instead cast into the gloomy darkness. Jesus called him Satan. And when Jesus was at his weakest, when that flesh that had been pressed upon him on the word of God was at its most vulnerable, after not having anything to eat, fasting for 40 days, having no shelter for 40 days or nights, Satan came to Jesus and tempted him with three things. Sustenance, certitude, and significance. And Jesus fought each temptation using the infallible word of God. Are you, are you tempted? Are you ever tempted? 
Are you under trial? And you find your head filling with the world's lies and your heart swayed to follow a shortcut to find your sustenance, your daily bread, your shelter, or your, or your certitude. Yeah, I need to be confident. I need to be confident in who I am or your significance. My life's going to matter for something. And you find yourself tempted to take a shortcut. Fall upon the Word of God. Fall upon the Word of God and let it fill you. You see, the father of lies, the father of lies cannot refute the truth of God's Word. Jesus left, left that wilderness and he was filled with the Holy Spirit and knowing full well who he is and knowing full well who he came to do and he began teaching in his home region of, uh, in the region of uh, Galilee, teaching and uh, healing people. And he returned to the synagogue in Nazareth, his hometown, on the Sabbath, the place where he had worshipped and learned since he was a toddler. And Jesus stood up to read the scroll from the prophet Isaiah one Sabbath and he spoke these words about the coming Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind. To set at liberty those who are oppressed. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now I grew up in a small town. And I know small towns have long memories. Long memories. And this small town would have remembered that Jesus' mother was pregnant when she got married. And there might have been perhaps even whispers about who Mary knew her son to be. And after Jesus read that passage, every eye in the synagogue was upon him. And he said to them these words, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. Imagine a young child that you babysat in the nursery, that you taught in Sunday school, for whom you were an advisor in youth group who you saw them when they went away to college and they come back one day and they worship with you and then one day they stand up and they say, you know what? I'm God's son. I am the son of God, the only begotten son of God who has come to save you from your sin. How would you respond? We never, never expect to find God under our nose. We never expect to meet our Lord and Savior in the common, in the everyday, in the mundane. We believe that we have to climb some kind of mountaintop or achieve some kind of nirvanic enlightenment to meet God. The meaning that the Word of God became flesh is that God meets us where we are. He turns up in the familiar. He turns up in the common. He turns up in the mundane. He turns up in the everyday. Jesus' own people at Nazareth, those closest to him, rejected him. They even tried to throw him off a cliff. Now, it wouldn't be the last time that his own people would despise him and seek another savior. Jesus' own family, we are told, even tried to stop him from his work, saying to a crowd, and these are the precise words from scripture, he is out of his mind. He is out of his mind. So the next time your family says about you, you know what? You're out of your mind. You can say, you know, they said the same thing about Jesus. And you would be right. You would be right. If you try that, let me know how it all goes. Um, so Jesus, because he was rejected, left Nazareth. And he continued to, to teach and heal. And when he taught, people listened. And they were astonished because he didn't teach like the other rabbis. He's, he's, his word possessed real authority. In the synagogue at uh, Capernaum. He met a man who had, who had a demon living in him, an evil spirit, a fallen angel living within him. And when he saw Jesus, he cried out. He said, Ha! Ha! What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are. I know who you are. You are the Holy One of God. 